Hello and welcome to another edition of the Job Hunter podcast, the show that aims to find some of those interesting jobs from around the UK. I'm your host Tim French and coming up on this week's show we find out how to survive getting trapped in quicksand, how to get your step count up and the best way to navigate across the sands and beaches of Morecambe Bay when the tide is out. So grab your rain mac, grab a sturdy walking stick and dive into the ordinary ocean that is this week's story. So today on the Job Hunter podcast, it's my pleasure to welcome Michael Wilson. Michael holds the rare and prestigious title of the Queen's Guide to the Sands, an ancient honour that pays the princely sum of £15 uh, and is one of the oldest professions uh, in in Britain, I suppose. Um, But before I say too much more, why don't we get Michael to explain a little bit more about his curious job title? Uh, right, good evening. I'm Michael Wilson. I'm the 26th guide to the River Kent of Morecambe Bay. There's two guides in Morecambe Bay, one for the River Kent and one for the River Leven, which is the other guide is Ray Porter. Uh, I've uh, took over Cedric Robson's job, who's now got to the grand old age of 86 and found it a bit too hard to carry on. But he's still an ambassador and still taking an active part in the role. So you've, you said you're the 46th guide now. To 26. The 26, sorry. Um, when did this all start? I imagine it's not something that happened recently. Um, why has there been a need for someone to guide people across the sands of Morecambe? Well, it became a need for basically when they were trading from Lancashire into Cumbria, the port of Lancaster, the they boats would land there and then obviously they'd come and take the goods round by road, but it was a lot shorter across the bay. But people were going across the bay and obviously getting stuck in the notorious quicksands or getting cut off by the tide. So uh, I think it was Henry VIII decided to appoint two guides to the bay because if you look at the bay, you go from Lancaster into Markham, across to Grange over Sands, where I'm based, and then from Grange you will walk across the land to the village of Flutborough, and then across there into Wolverston. If you're going, or instead of going, I think it's, I can't remember now, about a 12 mile trip instead of 60 miles. So it was a, a big saving for them. And what sort of things were they transporting across the Sands? Anything and everything. That, that was the whole point of it, uh, from sheep to cotton to tobacco to booze to anything. So pretty much it was the M1 of the, uh, the what, 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 what era would have that been if it was Henry VIII, the Tudors, isn't it? Yeah. Excellent. And um, obviously it's not something that you can go and do in, in at university or, or at school. How do you get into being the Queen's Guide? I'm guessing it's a lot of... Practicing a lot of walking. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, I, I basically got the job because uh, Cedric uh, expressed his opinion that I should get the job. But uh, he's known my family. I'm a fisherman. My father was a fisherman. My grandfather was a fisherman. We've all been fishermen. So we've worked. I've worked the bay since I left school, and I'm now 48. So I've got a few years' experience out there. And um, and what exactly does your your job entail kind of day to day. What 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 kind of role do you take uh, on? Well, the job's changed. Obviously, the job was for guiding the the goods across the bay when it all got set up, and then it was superseded by the railway when they built the railway, and it became basically a bit. It, it was just a role. There was no need for it anymore. But then Cedric has become this. Everybody knows this. Uh, walks across the bay and raises massive amounts of money for charities. So yeah, it's took a lot, but it's it's a good thing to have, and it's it's very popular. Uh, so you'd say that it's it's kind of transformed into this kind of charitable good goodwill type role, where you're a kind of helping people across the sands, but doing it for good causes. Yeah, it's become more a leisure tourist thing than an actual uh, industrial thing, where it, where it was originally set up. For. So you know, let's say at the height of summer, what, how many? Kind of crossings are you doing? What 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 what's the frequency uh, that you're doing? Well, this, this year we're we're just starting them out now. Hopefully, if it goes ahead because of COVID, but we still have to hopefully plan that they will. So there's going to be sixteen 
weekends walks this this year. So the 16 walks planned for this year up to now. And yeah. So it's, it's every other weekend we have to do it because of the tides and the times and everything. I mean, you can cross every day, don't get me wrong, but the, 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 uh, a niche where, you know, everybody wants to walk at the weekends and then it's every other weekend because one weekend it's low tides, which we prefer to walk on. It's a lot easier. And the next weekend it's high tides where you'd have to walk at basically five or six o'clock in the morning or five or six o'clock at night, which is too late. Uh, so... How far does the tide go out then? I imagine if you can walk a whole way across the sands from, you know, Cumbria to Lancashire, it must be quite far. Oh, yeah, yeah. When it, when, when it goes out, it leaves, it exposes 120 square, square miles of sand. So there's a, a big, vast area out there. And um, how do you not get lost? How do you, how do you manage to navigate it? Because I imagine it's just a big, flat expanse of sand. No, no, it's not. There's lots of gullies and channels, what we recognise and you get used to. But now with modern air, we have GPS, but we still tend to do it on the traditional way of putting laurel bushes in the in the sand. They also, they're very good, the actors like marking points and gathering points, you know, as the walkers set off, you can... You gather them up again because if you if you imagine you've got five hundred people out there, they all walk at different speeds, and we can only go as fast as the slowest one. So, yeah, it, it, that's why we tend to use the laurel bushes still now. And anybody who is uh, unfamiliar, because we have uh, helpers, we have marshals, and, and people who come on the walks, they also know about the laurel bushes. So, it, yeah, it, it's basically a dot to dot across the bay. So, what? Why do you need these laurel bushes? What? What particularly? Is it what's so dangerous about walking across the sands without a guide? Uh, well, you can either get cut off by the tide, which we've eliminated because we go at the right time. A lot of people just start wandering about the wrong time. And obviously the notorious quicksand. So, uh, and, and just for some of our viewers and listeners that might not be aware of why quicksand is so dangerous, um, what can happen if you get caught in it? Uh, well, you can basically disappear. <laughs> you tend to not go that far down, but you can get stuck in it and cause a lot of problems. And that, is that basically because it's it's so like full of water, it just turns to it, it's a mixture. Of, it's a mixture of yeah. It's a mix, what the, what the problem is. It's a mixture of the fresh water coming in contact with the salt water, and they're lying layers under the sand. So when people put the weight on the top, it just emulsifies, and then all of a sudden they start to sink down into it. That must be pretty scary. Have you ever have you ever been trapped in that, or you been lucky so far? I've been lucky so far. I've been, <laughs> I've been stuck a few times in mud, but that <laughs> would work. But yeah, oh, excellent. And um, what would you say to people um, who might consider doing this kind of role? Like I said, obviously you got picked by Cedric, um, but obviously you must have had some experience of doing this kind of thing before he kind of considered asking you yeah well i had helped on the walks before with him and obviously we're fishing and, and, and working in the river the river is the most dangerous part of the crossing but we work in the river all the time when we're shrimping so yeah we've had a a, a vast experience of knowledge <laughs> so tell me a bit more about about that um you know what is it you love about being a fisherman uh you know compared to say someone who might want to do an office job, what makes you want to go out and, and trimp? Uh, the freedom, basically. Yeah, you, you, you're your own boss. You, you, you can go when you want, when you don't want to. Basically, you have to go all the time because we all have to make a living. But, yeah, it's more the freedom and the, and the environment, the, the place where we work. It's wonderful. I'm guessing you're, you're not, you don't get seasick or anything like that? No, well, you <laughs> see, we don't get seasick because we go on tractors. Ah, interesting. Our boats, yeah, because it's so, all, no, we no work boats. when tides gone out. I see. see we, we, we can set uh, what we call fixed engines nets. We set them, but obviously they catch the fish when the tide comes in. Then when the tide retreats back out, we go out on our tractors and fish the nets, and we gather cockles and mussels and go shrimping. We saw we we track to work. So oh, and a bit more now. We quad bikes have come onto the scene a bit. We use quad bikes a bit more. They're a bit faster and. But obviously, you can't shrimp with a quad bike. You need a tractor to pull the trailer. So it's not really fishing, is it? It's like tractoring or something like that. You have to think of a new yeah, name. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're unique fishermen, shall we say. <laughs> and 
what would you say to people who may not have visited that part of of, of the UK? You know, if you could paint kind of a, a an auditory picture of of of, of the bay, um, what sort of picture could you paint? Uh, well, imagine a desert that's wet. <laughs> There's a vast amount of sand and a, and a vast array. It can change from day to day. It depends on if it's a lovely hot summer's day and the sand's dry. It can be very desertified. Very, it can blow up sandstorms. And then if it's a wet day and it suddenly rains, it all obviously the sand goes are very muddy and it's a it's a, just a different array every time you go. And um, how do you think the old you know? <laughs> How do you think your role might change in the future? Do you think do you think it's always going to be this kind of charitable guiding ah. aspect, or do you think it it could change again? From obviously you've taken it on from when Cedric did it, and obviously the the twenty four people before you two. Do you think it's going to evolve again? Uh, no, I can see it's going to be more of a charitable ledger thing now than it whatever. I don't think it'll ever go back to a commercial reason, you know. It, that's gone now. There's roads and railway. It's just a charity, yeah. And I guess you know, are you quite proud of of the fact that you've hold this you hold this kind of deeply historic role, and and uh, it's something that you know you do you keep this for life? Is this something that you do until you decide to stop, or has it got like a fixed uh, fixed period to it? <laughs> No, it hasn't got a fixed period. It's basically as long as you're able to carry on doing the job, you have the job. But uh, there's some, quite a few guys have just carried on till they've died. So, so you're kind of like a fisherman. You're not. You're kind of like the Pope, but for for walking across the sand. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Um, you know, as I said before, there might be some people out there that that you know want to do guide work might maybe not necessarily on the sands but what advice would you give to someone that wants to be you know uh not a tour guide but someone who guides people um adventurer guide or something like that what what advice would you give them um for getting getting into it or or being persistent with it uh the the best advice i would say is, is know what you're doing if, if you want to be a, a mountain guide or you know walk that mountain 100 times 200 times to your in where you're going and, and everything and then you know, you know, you can expect every aspect of the weather and everything. You know, it's different. Like obviously, the walk for us are in summer. You know, it's completely different in the middle of winter walking across the bay or working in the bay. But you know, it's obviously classed as really too dangerous to do. You know, to do walks. It's not really. It's more of a pleasure thing we do than you know, uh, uh, what we say commercial. And what, what what advice would you give for tourists as well, you know, who obviously might be listening to this um, and might think, oh, I want to go and do that, um, you know, but potentially might decide to do it not under the organised walks uh, you have planned. Um, what advice or potential warnings would you give anyone that wants to do that? Uh, be very aware. Be very careful. Uh, basically stay at home. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It's not a place to go out unless you know what you're doing. So unless you can see the laurel and you're with someone that knows what they're doing, don't. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Um, do you think that uh, there might be some aspects that are quite tough about the job? Do you think that, you know, there's some things that you that that you think, oh, I just wish I didn't have to do that. Or there's, you know, things that you think could be done, could be better or something? Uh, the, the biggest thing I'm finding is, like I say, we, we organise the walks now and we send it out on emails and we put it on the website. And, but then you, you tend to worry about the weather and what the channel's going to be like. You, you can't predict these things. You know, you're planning in six months in advance. So, yeah, it, I know we, we stay on the website. It's very weather dependent and everything. But, yeah, you, there is a certain amount of pressure that, People come. It can be, for example, it can be a really horrible wet week, and the river's in full flow. But then the weekend comes, and it's lovely, glorious sunshine. And you have to say, "Well, I'm sorry, we can't go." And they say, "Why?" And then you know you try to explain to people that, that the river is just too dangerous to cross. So yeah, it, it, it's a worry there about things, but otherwise, man, it's all in all, it's quite good fun. 
So again, you think there's aspects of your job that have transformed over the years from from doing just the guiding and, and focusing on the outdoors aspect of being a bit of a administrator and and social media expert to get getting the information out to people about about the walks. Yeah, yeah, definitely so. Uh, and I mean, as the walks have become so popular, like we we uh, we have limited them to five hundred people a walk. I mean, we could get, potentially get up to thousands coming. Well. It's a lot easier to guide twenty people than five hundred people. So you know, we stay on the on the website now. If you're a charity, you have to bring a marshal per fifty walkers, and we have a lot a team of good help. I have a team of good people who help me and volunteers who come and and they all know what they're doing because you imagine we, sometimes if I sit off of the front, we, we can be quite easily a mile spread out to the back. So we have some a couple of marshals at the back who walk at the back every time and they make sure everybody's all right at the back and we keep stopping and gathering up. You mentioned um, a bit about COVID. Um, how has it affected you this year? Obviously, you've said you've, you've arranged the dates for next year and hopefully it's going to happen, but how has it already affected you? Uh, well, we've, we tend to find that the, the charity is only book Two or three hundred spaces are only booking 100, 150 spaces. They're a bit cautious, you know. Uh, otherwise, I mean, we're, we're planning from the first work walks at end of April till the beginning of September. So we're tending to find that the, the later walks on later on in the year, July, August ones are getting booked up and not so much early ones because obviously we're still going to be in lockdown till basically at the end of March. And it, then the first walks four weeks after that, well, potentially it might not go ahead. So but we, we, we all live and hope they do. And of course, if you're listening to this and you're wanting to go to to, to the Morecambe Bay, um, please wait until the lockdown's over. If you listen to this before, you have to stay at home yeah. alone. So um, plan your trip, um, maybe speak to Michael if, if we can and, and wait until it's safe to do so. Please don't go out now. Um, I like to do a little section um, in my in my podcast, uh, I've called it Tim's Three Tips, um, where basically I ask, ask my experienced and knowledgeable guest um, to give some advice that you, that our listeners can kind of take away uh, and implement in their own kind of daily lives. Um, so Michael, um, obviously you've mentioned a bit about quicksand and, and how dangerous it is. Um, so what kind of advice would you give to anyone that needs to stay calm in a stressful situation, um, you know, as if they were stuck in quicksand, what's what's kind of tips would you give them? Uh, well, it depends if there's a group of you and there's only one stuck. Obviously, don't go near them. Just stay calm. Make sure they're all right. Tell them to stay still. And then obviously contact the authorities and just stay with them at a safe distance. But don't go into – people tend to rush in and try to pull them out and then they get stuck as well, which is a big no no Maybe – say, well, you're not sinking anymore now, you're stuck up to your waist. We've contacted the authorities. They're coming, just calm them and, and say, you know, they'll come and get you out. But don't tend to rush in. And if you are stuck, um, what advice would you give to someone? You know, maybe that you're not in a group and you are stuck. Um, what what can you do? Uh, well, the, the best job is to sit down. To sit down and relax and just stay still. And then think about your situation. Just think, is anybody to notice me or can I phone them on a mobile phone or and if you can't well then obviously you've got to think about I'll, I'll sit here quietly for five or ten minutes build up all my energy and then try and crawl out excellent excellent um can you think of any times that you're out on the sands that were particularly memorable for you there's there been anything where you know either it's been a really amazing experience or kind of a slightly scary experience out there that you can kind of share with us? Oh, yeah, there's a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the, a lot of it's uh, the weather. I mean, we, we were once shrimping in November down by Power Station, you know where that is, and then this fog bank rolled in and it went from seeing all around the bay and all the lights around the bay to complete cold. The temperature dropped and it was cold and, you know, a completely eerie, eerie feeling about the place. When you're six or seven miles out and all that happens, it's quite a, an adventure to talk about. So you, so you kind of lose your surroundings. So imagine that to be, must be quite scary when you're just in a in a flat wall of fog, effectively, and you don't know which way is which. 
Yeah, well, that was it. it you, you could see it coming. You could see the lights going out on the base. It come up from Blackpool. You could see everything just like someone was turning a switch off and they were going out. And then all of a sudden it hit you and everything went out behind you. Yeah, it was quite an experience, was that? Amazing. Um, I haven't got too many more questions. Um, you've obviously mentioned Cedric. Um, do you want to give a bit of background on him and a bit about his life? He's got an MBE. Um but do you want to kind of talk about what he did for, for the role and everything? Yeah, if you want, yeah. Uh, well, Cedric, when he took on the job, I think he, he did it for 56 years. And basically when he started doing the walks across the bay, it, it was just, it, it would just sort of roll up at Arnside or S Bank and put a board out and take a few people across and his wife would give him a cup of tea at the other end and... And basically, I think he got a few donations and he set off doing that when fishing was quiet. And then he, he, he sort of, it become very popular and he got people contacting him. I'd love to walk across the bay. And then obviously charities got involved and it's, and it's evolved into this wonderful thing it is now. Amazing. And yeah, obviously he's got an MBE. Was that related to his, his charitable work? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, is that something that you you've got in the back of your mind? You think obviously you're the queen's queen's guy to the sands, but you're not actually appointed by the queen, are you? So no. Maybe maybe it'd be nice to be able to go and meet meet the big boss herself. Yeah, you never know. You never know. So, are you are you planning to keep this going for a while? Are you hoping to be in your eighties when you when Hopefully, you retire? God willing, yeah, I hope to keep my action about as long as I can. That must be a hell of a lot of steps, though. You, if you imagine, how far is that crossing? If you're doing that, you know, six six times, whatever it is, in a weekend. 16, well, it's uh, three times a weekend. We walk it on the Friday, just me and my team, just make sure everything's all right and put some fresh brobs in and check everything because every time it changes a bit. Yeah, so we, 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 we walk about 20 miles a weekend. So, so 20 miles a weekend, how many how many years do you reckon? How many weekends do you do it in a year? Uh, about 10. So 200 miles a year. Yeah. And how many years you, you, you have you done it so far? I've done two. So, now. Obviously, see. last year we didn't walk so many because there was no walks. <laughs> so you've done 400 miles so far and you're planning to, to to go on for a good few decades. So you're probably going to have a fair few miles under your belt by the time you finish. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully so, yeah. Excellent. Oh, I mean, there can't be many people that can lay claim to that one. Um Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you so much for talking today. Um, obviously, this was a, a job I knew pretty much nothing about, so I've learned a lot already, um, and I'm looking forward to learning more. Um, where can people find out more information about this? Because this, I imagine it is quite hard to find information about about this uh, kind of thing. So we've got a website now. If you go on uh, the guy who understands website, it comes up there, all the information you need to know now. My good in, uh, and if, if people want to walk it, um, what would you recommend they do? Do you think, yeah. think it'd be better to go through a charity or just, just go on the website? Uh, go on the website. It's also on Facebook and Instagram. So, yeah, we're getting it out there now. But it, it depends. A lot of people just, if you go on the Facebook or Instagram or find the dates of the walks, because obviously some people are on holiday or whatever, and we, we'll post on there what particular charities are walking on that weekend and then we advise them to contact them. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you very much for talking to me this, this evening. Um, I hope you have a lovely 2021 and all your walks go ahead and you get your 200 miles in this year and um, stay safe uh, and I'll catch up with you soon. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. See you now. I think it's safe to say that was a truly fascinating conversation with Michael. My huge thanks to him for coming on and telling us all about his rather peculiar job. If you want to find out more about the Guide to the Sands or would like to take part in one of his guided walks, information can be found at www.guideoversands.co.uk. That's www.guideoversands.co.uk. If you've enjoyed the conversation, why not check out some of our other episodes of the Job Hunter podcast? And if you haven't already considered subscribing and leaving a positive review, why not? It helps us to reach a bigger audience and can mean I can attract new and exciting guests to the show. You can find us on social media as always, at Job Hunter Pod on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, where you can also find our support group where we post helpful tidbits from the show. You can also find us on YouTube, just search Job Hunter Podcast. Fancy coming on to chat about your interesting job? 
drop us an email. It's jobhunterpodcast at gmail.com. I really hope you've enjoyed learning along with me on this one. I'll be back same time next week to bring you more interesting professions on the Job Hunter podcast. See you next time. Hello and welcome to the Job Hunter podcast. I'm your host, Tim French. Have you ever wondered what it takes to become a fighter pilot? Or perhaps you've always wanted to be a fly on the wall inside an operating theatre. Maybe you're just interested in finding out more about some of Britain's most intriguing professions. Come along and join the virtual careers fair as I ask the nation about their vocations. From barristers to butchers, scientists to supermarket heroes and everything in between, the Job Hunter podcast will delve beneath the job title and talk to people at the heart of their professions. If you want to be involved, then get in touch. There is no job too small, no tail too tall. So sit back, relax, grab a cuppa and enjoy the show. Enjoy the show.